you very much for turning up this evening for what I hope will be an interesting debate on the subject of libel reform. Uh, my task this evening is not to get engaged in the polemic. Uh, heaven knows, prior to the election, I got very heavily involved in some of the, uh, the debates and indeed joined the election as a very good uh, rally which was organised by English Penn and others. But by virtue of being a law officer for a crown, I am there now to advise rather than to lead the policy. And perhaps I should be rather reassured that that's the case. It's taking a small weight off my shoulders. Uh, the Ministry of Justice will have the task of uh, promoting and implementing changes to the libel laws. In doing that, and just to set the scene, I want to emphasize that the coalition was is not prescriptive in its views. There is a recognition that libel law as it stands at the moment is unsatisfactory. Some would argue profoundly unsatisfactory. Equally, there is a very strong sense that the right to bring an action for defamation and to seek redress for the consequences, sometimes catastrophic consequences, which defamation can bring is a right that is not to be lightly discarded. It's therefore necessary for the coalition in addressing these issues to find a way through it. There are differing views. And this evening, with Joe Glanville, Nigel Tate, Joanne Cash, Alistair Mullis and Anthony Lester, we are going, I think, to hear the full spectrum uh, of uh, views uh, about how this issue should be addressed. I'd just like to say how much I welcome that. It will help inform the debate. So far as um, the future is concerned and about how the coalition intends to go about its business, I know that my Ministry of Justice colleagues are already working on this project. But it's not a matter that's going to be rushed. It is certainly the intention uh, that sometime in the course of the coming months, there will be an opportunity uh, for draft measures to be considered and for further public debate to take place. Beyond that, I don't think much more need be said. What we need at the moment is an active and serious debate, firstly to identify what's wrong, secondly to identify what might be done about it, and thirdly to ensure that in the process of doing that, we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Now, having said all those things, I'm now going to act as the neutral and impartial arbiter of this debate. I don't suppose it's going to have to be a, a very onerous task. I've asked and suggested that the speakers should speak for eight minutes each, which with the numbers present should take us about halfway through our session. And then I very much hope that the second half of the session can be entirely devoted to questions and to a rigorous dis debate and discussion on the issues. Thank you again for coming along, and without more ado, I intend to proceed with the debate. Thank you. And to initiate it, I should have said at the beginning, I'm going to ask Joe Glanville, um, who has been a journalist for many years prior to going to edit Index on Censorship, uh, to address you. Um, I'll just tell you a little bit first, I think, about Index on Censorship, for those of you who don't know it. It's a free speech organisation, campaigns for the protection of freedom of speech here but around the world, it produces a magazine which I edit and has been an instrumental part of the libel reform campaign, along with English Pen and Sense About Science, who I'm pleased to see are both here tonight. And when I joined Index three years ago, after working at the BBC as a producer for many years, it was a really great puzzle to me that there wasn't a campaign for libel reform. Free speech organisations here were busy calling for freedom of expression in China, Iran, Saudi Arabia. But what about the big chill in our own backyard? I really couldn't really understand it. And when I talked to lawyers about it, the view seemed to be, well, things are actually better than they've ever been. We've got um, damages capped. The media now has a public interest defence for responsible journalism, the Reynolds defence, things are okay. And that view, coupled with the establishment's visceral mistrust of the press, 
seemed to ensure the inertia that reigned at that time. But over the past two years, that position has, has radically changed. And we've seen, in now in a very short space of time, we've seen the Select Committee inquiry into privacy and libel, we've seen the Ministry of Justice Working Party, Lord Justice Jackson's review of costs, and most recently, Lord Leicester's bill, which um, has really served to change the landscape, so that just 11 days ago, as I'm sure you all know, Lord McNally stood up during the second reading of Lord Leicester's bill and announced that the government would be publishing a draft defamation bill early next year. And I'd like to pay special tribute to Anthony Leicester for what he's done. We wouldn't be where we are now without him. Now, our own, our own coalition of, of NGOs, all um, English Pen, Index on Censorship and Sense About Science, all coming from slightly different areas, um, we managed to get 52,000 signatures signing a petition for libel reform, and we managed to get a commitment from all three main parties in their manifestos to reviewing libel law. And I would say, though, that looking back at how fast things seem to have happened, that the starting gun was really fired, though a lot of people here I know won't like this, was fired by the Americans um, and by the United Nations. And I'm sure a lot of you would have seen as well this week that the libel tourism bill has, has just gone through another round and it's very likely that it might well be passed um, before the summer recess. It wasn't just the Americans who, who different states started passing laws, including New York and Florida, to protect themselves from, principally from us, from their citizens being sued in our courts. But also the United Nations Human Rights Committee made a very important statement as well at the same time in the summer, I think, of 2008, criticizing us for the, the chill um, not just on critical media reporting, but also the chill on, on scholars in publishing their work. So for the first time, our, our laws had actually become an international embarrassment, and I think that was very uncomfortable for everyone. It was okay, it was our own little domestic embarrassment, but once it sort of went out of these shores, it, it became truly embarrassing, and that really got people's attention. But I think the other thing that had been happening at the same time, it even become earlier, was obviously the Human Rights Act and also the impact of the internet. So just as, as free speech was becoming a positive right for the first time, the old rules of the game were being challenged by the publishing revolution online. And libel, which had somehow survived wholesale reform, I mean, even really, it had survived reform during the first mass publishing revolution, it suddenly really clearly seemed due for an overhaul. Now, there is a lot of resistance to reform, and, and you'll hear some of those views tonight. Um, but I think part of the, that resistance comes from the belief that our libel laws are really the only effective muzzle standing between the defenceless British public and the rabidly feral press. And um, Alistair Marlis, um, who very kindly showed me um, a paper that, that hasn't yet been published, worries that Lord Leicester's private members bill might actually herald the death of libel. Now to me that seems um, a rather distorted perception and it's a perception that neglects how the public, how you are muzzled, any, any of you who blog or write, who are scholars, who might be doctors, um, you too are muzzled. It's not just a matter of the big bad media being muzzled. So there are quite a few recent cases that a lot, of, a lot of you might know of because they've had a lot of publicity. Most famously, the Simon Singh case. He's a science writer who was sued by the British Chiropractic Association for criticising the lack of evidence for their treatment. Then there's Peter Wilmshurst, the cardiologist. Again, he expressed concern. And um, in, 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 in this case, it was about data from a clinical trial of a heart device. He's still going through um, um, the threats of a libel action. Another one, Henrik Thompson, a Danish radiologist, um, who also faced libel action. Now, all these were cases where, quite clearly, open criticism is not just important <coughs> for freedom of expression, but for the advancement of knowledge, and even for our, for, you know, for our own lives, for our health. And what could be more important than that? But we've got libel laws that, that allow any bully to use them to protect their own interests very, very easy to launch a libel action, and one of the important um, proposals in Lord Leicester's bill um, goes some way to make it more difficult 
to launch a libel action. In my own case, I edit um, uh, a quarterly publication that looks at free speech around the world. We look at Russia, we look at China, we look at Iran. I published pieces by people like Dmitry Muratov, who's the editor of Novaya Gazeta, which some of you may know. It's the paper that Anna Politskovsky worked for, who was brutally murdered um, some four years ago. She's one of many who, who have been murdered on that paper. Um, also Lydia Cacho, an extremely brave Mexican journalist who was kidnapped and tortured after she exposed a pedophile ring. I get pieces from these people, and then I go through hell or sweating about the libel problems. I have less freedom, actually, in what I can publish here, written by them, than they have, ironically enough, in terms of what they can publish. And I've also had to spike pieces, which I know are in the public interest, I know are written by journalists who have integrity, who have responsibility, because my writers who are going through the motions of responsible journalism contacting the sources, making sure the source has the right, the right that the source, but the, the subject of the piece has the right of reply. And even so, I've had to spike pieces because I know that a libel action could ruin the organization that I work for. Now this situation is partly without a doubt because of costs. It's also because of the uncertainty of the Reynolds defense. We do not have a robust public interest defense. It's also because of the problem with the presumption of damage, that anyone, there's an assumption, presumption that the claimant um, has in some way been damaged when they bring a libel action. Um, the claimant doesn't have to prove that his words have caused any damage. Damage is presumed. And this makes it difficult to strike out trivial claims. Now, all of these issues must be addressed in any reform. And it's become even more urgent since last Friday when the Times lost a case, a, a, a case that it had won um, on a Reynolds defence um, was overturned in the Court of Appeal last week. And we were already very concerned about the public interest defence. We, we've been campaigning for a long time for a robust public interest defence. We've been told repeatedly, you've got Reynolds, you've got the Reynolds defence, that works, leave it alone, it's fine. This shows once and for all that it's absolutely not fine. We had to wait, I think, around 10 years for the first successful Reynolds defence. In fact, this was, I think, the first major national newspaper to win a Reynolds defence. And I wonder how many more years are we going to have to wait? Who's going to want to use the Reynolds defence in future? And who's going to have any faith in its defence? And by my calculation, most of us here will either be drawing our pensions or will be at the great high court in the sky before anything changes through common law. And that, to me, is the most recent example of why it's absolutely essential that we have reform and that we have legislation. And I'm very much looking forward to what happens. And if, um, if any of you haven't looked at Lord Lester's bill, I do encourage you to, to read it and also to read the explanatory notes because, aside from anything else, they give a very valuable historical guide of all the attempts there have been to reform libel since 1948, and it's quite a depressing read. So please let's not waste this opportunity by undervaluing the importance of freedom of speech. Thanks. Next, ladies and gentlemen, I will ask Nigel Tate, Carter Ruck. In the House of Commons last Thursday, the Labour MP Paul Farrelly said that the big elephant in the room, which Lord Leicester's bill does not address and does, does not intend to address, <coughs> is cost. Costs are the overriding issue, said Paul Farrelly. Many of the problems with our libel laws, said Mr Farrelly, would not be so pressing if it were not for the cost. I have to say I entirely agree. In the last 25 years or so that I've been at Carter Ruck, I've seen one reform after another which just piles cost upon cost. Reforms to the law and reforms to procedure. Um, there has been the pre-action protocol, the need for a pre-action letter, front-loading of costs. Court fees have risen in the case of issuing a claim form by a spectacular 3,000% during my career. Particulars of damage need to be pleaded in the particulars of claim. And the costs involved in, pre in preparing a defence have grown enormously. The reason for that is that in the old days, a newspaper would just have the one defence, but its uh, story was substantially true. But now a newspaper has many defences. 
it's not uncommon to see a defense of responsible journalism, a, response of just, a defense of justification, and a defense of reportage uh, in the same defense. The defenses just get bigger and bigger. And once we get served with the defense, we have to serve, and this is since I started at Carter Ruck, a document called the reply. It's a good thing, but it's very expensive. On top of that, in my career, we've had to serve st witness statements on the other side. Um, I don't criticize any of this, but it just piles cost upon cost upon cost upon, upon cost. And my point about Lord Leicester's bill, which I'm going to come on to in development, is that it's great to make claimants have to prove this and that, that they have to prove damage or substantial damage or that they'll be likely to be damaged. But a determined claimant is going to prove it. And at the end of the day, when the defendant settles the case, when it pays out, it's going to find itself lumbered with even more costs. Um, just when you thought costs couldn't get any higher and they'd been packed to the hilt, along came conditional fee agreements, which doubled the costs in some cases. On top of that, after the event insurance increased costs further. Reading through the explanatory notes to Lord Leicester's bill, I was reminded that the Porter Report on libel, which was published in 1948, found even then that the law and practice in actions for defamation was unnecessarily complicated and unduly costly. I wonder what members of the committee would have made of the costs of procedure now in 2010. I have attended a great many discussions on Lord Leicester's bill and libel reform. Some lawyers see reform within it, some lawyers see codification. Some say the bill goes too far and others say it doesn't go far enough. I see all of this, but what I also see is the potential for a lawyer's feeding frenzy, which could well last for over a decade, clarifying points in the bill which need to be clarified. Um, whereas now, if, you want, if you're a defendant and you want to serve a defense of responsible journalism, what would you do if Lord Leicester's bill uh, is enacted? You will not just serve, possibly, a defense of responsible journalism of common law. You may also wish to serve a defense of statutory responsible journalism. And the problem is the defenses are likely to be quite different. Assume for one moment that you're a responsible journalist, that the source of your information does not have an axe to grind, and that you contacted the claimant and published the gist of his response before in your article, and that the tone of your article was measured. These specific factors are missing from Lord Leicester's draft bill, but are set out in the decision in Reynolds, as we know. Do you as a defendant plead the common law defence of responsible journalism, or do you take your chances and plead the statutory defence, or do you plead both, and will one of them be struck out? Given that the bill excludes a number of the factors in Reynolds, but also invites the court to take into account all the circumstances, is it the case that the factors I've mentioned should be given less weight, or should they be given equal weight to what we said in Reynolds? Um, these are expensive questions to litigate, and where I differ principally with Lord Leicester is that I do not believe it is sensible for any government to pass legislation in this field, where rights of reputation and freedom of expression are concerned, without considering the costs implications of the legislation itself. I don't think you can say costs will be dealt with somewhere else. Do you really think a determined corporation will be put off by the fact that it needs to establish that an allegation is likely to cause it damage? It is just the same with reversing the burden of proof which some people are in favour of of. If you ask a claimant to prove that the allegation is false, it will spend money doing so. It will spend a great deal of money. And once it proves you that the allegation is false. It will ask you to pay its costs, and the costs will just go up and up. Um, what I have heard in these debates are concerns from scientists and academics about freedom of expression being stifled. There is no point liberalising the law if scientists and academics, or local newspapers for that matter, cannot afford to use it, because the reforms themselves have driven up the costs. I have some modest suggestions of my own for reform. When the government looks at Lord Leicester's bill, or when it produces its own draft bill, it should ask itself very seriously whether the additional costs that are likely to arise to litigants, whether claimants or defendants, outweigh the perceived benefits. Every clause and subclause needs to be considered from that point of view. Secondly, it seems to me that the time has come when, due to reasons of costs, a judge should decide the meaning of the words complained of at an early stage of an action, regardless of whether or not the case is to be tried by a jury. Thirdly, very serious consideration should be given to a more radical reform of the law than is proposed to protect scientists and academics. 
Although the Reynolds defence should protect responsible science and scientists and academics, it is expensive, time-consuming, it often fails, as we've heard every national newspaper has lost that defence, um, and it does not, and it may not go far enough for scientists and academics. The government should seriously consider providing scientists and academics, where they are publishing within their own communities, a statutory defence of traditional qualified privilege, which can only be defeated by proof of dishonesty. If the stories are true, that scientists are inhibited from commenting upon drugs, etc., and I think the government should ask for proof upon that, something needs to be done about this urgently. Proper, safe, proper safeguards need to be built in if the law is to be reformed in this way. Desmond Brown, who's sitting in front of me, uh, suggested last week that for medical journals to be afforded such a defence, the article must have been the subject of peer review. For my part, I would only support such a defence where there was a statutory right for the subject of the libel defamation to be allowed to publish a statement by way of explanation or contradiction. I believe such a measure would encourage debate rather than stifle it. Finally, the judges who are trained in the law need to be trained and apply rigorous case management. It is simply too expensive to litigate over side alleys and unworn paths. Base costs need to be brought down if the conditional fee system is to work, and so must success fees, but not to the point where access to justice is impeded. It is not just claimants who use no win, no fee agreements. The courts need to firmly manage cases so that the real point at issue between the parties is decided, not countless satellite points about whether an article caused damage or substantial damage or is likely to cause damage. But this needs to be done, um, otherwise the elephant in the room will grow so large that there won't be room for anyone else. Thank you. Somebody suggested that if it was a daughter, it could be called Libella. <laughs> <laughs> well, good evening, everyone. It's very nice to see so many familiar faces here this evening, um, and quite a few lawyers I recognise, as well as um, politicians. Um, I'm three days uh, from my due date, so I hope there's a doctor here somewhere too, talking about scientists and academics. It seemed like a terribly good idea to come and speak at the time I agreed, but I had no idea it would be so enormous. Uh, and perhaps even so out of breath. Um, I come to this from several different perspectives. I have been a one-time politician, as many of you know, and uh, I've experienced in that context uh, what it is like to be a public figure and to have one's uh, every move interpreted or misinterpreted and so on. So I've had my ideological commitment to free speech properly tested, and I am still here, um, and still uh, largely in support, apart from some of the details in which I agree um, with the other side of the house, but largely in support of reform, um, and reform urgently, I think. Um, I came to this about three or four years ago, and I've been campaigning very hard since, not just for libel reform, but for free speech in the UK generally. I think some terrible things have been happening. Um, they have happened sometimes as a result of terrorism and extremism, like the Danish cartoon bans, um, the, the, uh, sometimes as a result of uh, sensibilities and sensitivity, excessively so, uh, where plays have been taken off, and sometimes, as in this case, with libel reform, because the law has not, in my opinion, my humble opinion, <coughs> not in a legal forum, so I dare to say it, has not been applied as it might have been applied by the judges sitting. And I do think that that is the nub of this, that we have got um, very, very serious and some awesome opinions on both sides of the house, but that the difficulty for the opposition to reform is that at the end of the day, Reynolds, we keep talking in legal jargon, but Reynolds is the case which set up the public interest uh, defense of responsible journalism. Um, and we haven't had it applied, in my view, by the courts in the way that it should have been. Now the answer to that cannot be that the case is there, and of course the House of Lords has reiterated it since in Jamil, and therefore we should leave things as they are. If the state of affairs is that injustice is being done time and time and time again, in my view, then we must reform, and we must give the appropriate protection through the only other route that our democracy allows us to do in this country, and that is through statute 
um, through Parliament and the House of Lords. <coughs> now, I said I came to this from different perspectives. I am a libel barrister in my day job, and I have worked with most of the lawyers in this room, either for um, some of the solicitors or on the other side of some barristers. Indeed, one case which motivated me very much to get more heavily involved in the campaign for libel reform was shared by someone standing straight in front of me. And it's a case involving a woman called Gillian McKeith. And I was instructed in that case quite a while ago. This lady, some of you may know, I don't know for a start will know about this. This lady last week caused a floor on Twitter because she attacked a very serious and eminent scientific journalist in this country called Ben Goldacre, many of you will have heard of, um, accusing him of being a liar who takes money to promote pharmaceutical companies. So she's a lady who's loose with her allegations, it would seem. But she wasn't so very happy some years ago when the Sun published the fact that her doctorate was not in any way related to her holding herself out to be a doctor of food and health and safety. And that has since been well established and she stopped using that particular moniker. On behalf of the Sun newspaper, I was instructed to go before the court with a Reynolds defense. So we drafted it and set it out. Despite it being the Sun newspaper, they'd taken all reasonable steps. It seemed like a serious serious investigation had gone on, they had travelled to the States, they had visited the college and so on, and the judge sitting on that occasion said no. And I then began to watch very closely what was going on in those defences when newspapers sought to mount them. And I say against that background that I have regularly acted for claimants and regularly acted, instructed on conditional fee agreements as well, often, often allowing access to justice to people who wouldn't otherwise have had it. In fact, one case particularly rewarding against, of all people, a Tory multi-millionaire who attacked a Labour councillor for many years in Essex. So where does that leave us? We, leave, we have left with a situation where lawyers themselves, and there are many of us here in this room, have been frustrated by repeated decisions, not just ones I've been involved in, by looking and watching how the law is going. The House of Lords looked at this again in a case called Jamil. And I paraphrase, I take the liberty of paraphrasing again because I'm not in a legal forum and there's no time to read you tranches of that judgment. But they essentially said, look, for goodness sake, we set this all out in Reynolds. It's not being applied. Would you go away and do this properly? And it, it's still, there has been some improvement, but as we heard, not much improvement regarding the position of national newspapers. And so we are at a loss to know what else we can do except demand that the law be changed and tightened and codified, certainly with respect to the public interest argument in the form of a statutory defence of qualified privilege. And I do accept what Nigel says, that there may be ways of doing that by categorising certain types of information and certain types of commentators or public figures. The fact is, though, we are here because all parties at the last election, Conservative, Labour and Liberal Democrat, pledged to look at this issue and to make sure that reform happened. The coalition government is now following through on that and we've heard again the pledge that has been made that by the 2011-12 legislative period there will be uh, something done about it. So this is the time really for this debate to actually happen and to harness the views of the brains in this room, and of the, there are many of them sitting in front of me, many of them I recognise, um, to, to put views forward and to discuss how this can be most sensibly done. My own minimum manifesto um, would include some of the following. I agree with the removal of the presumption of trial by jury that is put forward in Lord Leicester's bill. I think that the jury trial allows the postponement of many decisions which the earlier resolution of would allow the reduction in costs and would allow the parties to know where they stood at a much earlier stage, meaning being just one. I think early compulsory resolution of meaning would be helped. I know that's not addressed in the bill, but I do think that's something that we should look at. There are facilities for doing that in the procedure which I won't tie you with at the moment, but they aren't regularly used. And in any case, they only allow the judge to decide whether it's capable of bearing a meaning. The meaning generally still has to be left to the jury. So you can have a whole case and all the costs that Nigel Tate was referring to rumbling forward to a jury trial only to find at the end of the case the jury doesn't find it bears the meaning at all. 
So that, it, that to me is a completely absurd, wasteful situation we have on our hands at the moment. I think that there should be a requirement for public figures, and I say this against myself having had my own minor experiences, and for corporations to show loss or damages. I would also go so far as to wondering whether corporations should fall into a different category regarding bringing actions at all, and I know that's something that Lord Lester has been keen on. I would tighten the requirements for minimal publication. I would make sure that there was clear statutory provision for what amounts to a proper substantial publication in this country, thereby avoiding the libel tourism that we have seen, the cases which have caused us to fall into disrepute internationally, and to be criticised by the United Nations Human Rights Committee. And whatever we say, and whatever differences we have in this room, I don't believe that there's anyone here who could possibly justify that position and, and want us to maintain a status quo which has embarrassed us internationally in such a way. I've already dealt with the qualified privilege, or public interest defence as I call it. I don't believe the answer is as it's set out in the bill, necessarily for the moment I say with respect to Lord Leicester, but I know he's also invited comment on this. But I do believe that he is right, that it needs to be addressed, and it needs to be tightened. And, it, and if necessary, the fact that there is going to be two defences put forward by defendants is not an answer to doing it. It's not a rebuttal, just because it might cause the need for some clarification and may lead to some applications in the early days. I think that on balance, the reforms overall would reduce the need for the amount of litigation that we currently have. And it would allow NGOs and individual bloggers and scientists and academics <coughs> to proceed excuse me, with more confidence in their investigations. On balance, I believe that reforming that part of the law and providing greater freedom for the defendants who are currently afflicted by it um, will improve serious investigative journalism in this country. And at the end of the day, that's got to be what this is all about. We want to be able to investigate terrorism. And as Lord Bew recently said in the House of Lords debate on this very subject, that the history, Oxford history of Ireland is incomplete because of the fear of libel actions. And we've got to be able to move away from that when we're talking about such serious subjects. There's another issue which we haven't discussed today. Costs, I agree with Nigel, must be a part of reform and they must, it's the elephant in the room regarding this bill, because as I learnt as a parliamentary candidate when I was campaigning, one talked about crime and crime statistics, which is often one of the biggest issues for voters. But fear of crime is as big an issue. And so sometimes people who lived where the lowest crime rates were, were much more terrified of something happening than those who lived in the midst of it all the time. And the same thing has happened with libel. There is a fear of libel as much as there is a risk of libel. And the fear is that, as Jo has pointed out, when she is considering what she publishes, is the danger of her uh, publication going out of business, causing destruction. Finally, the PCC. When I said there were several reasons why I became intensely involved in campaigning for libel reform um, just over three years ago, the PCC was one of the reasons why. I believe now that Baroness Buskin takes seriously the issues regarding the PCC, but I do believe that the lack, the failure of self-regulation of the press has led in large part to us being here today. I do not think that there should be senior executives of large news corporations on the board of the PCC. Um, I do not believe that there should be um, highly senior journalists or editors on the panels of the PCC. But most of all, I believe that the PCC, when it rules on public complaints or individual complaints about the press's conduct, should have bite when it issues its findings. And when I say bite, it should be able to order that public pub apologies are published proportionate to the damage done, because that costs money in advertising space. And there is only one thing that is understood by newspapers. And let's face it, People do get defamed. Reputations do get destroyed. Libel law is an important protection in this country, 
Van Goldacre has been a significant player in the campaign for libel reform and last week finds himself on the receiving end of Gillian McKeith's own attack. So it, it has to work both ways. We must retain the protection and balance it with freedom of expression. But everyone in this room who has shown an interest here tonight, I hope will also get behind the pressure which I hope from the comments made in the House of Lords debate last week will become a part of this movement, which is to increase self-regulation in the press and to move from the tittle-tattle that the tabloids feed us day to day to some really serious investigative journalism of which this country has a very proud tradition. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Joanne. And now I'm going to ask uh, Professor Alistair Mullis uh, of London University to speak next. I should add that there is going to be a vote imminently in the House of Commons on the finance bill. And um, I, for those who uh, need to go and vote, and I, have to I suspect I'm going to have to go and vote in this uh, vote uh, sufficiently importantly, so somebody else may have to take over the chair while that's happening. And Dean will doubtless oblige. Once of, uh, of London University, I currently at the University of East Anglia, actually. It's my, uh, my writing colleague, uh, Dr. Andrew Scott, uh, who is at the, uh, the London School of Economics. And it's a very great pleasure to be, uh, to be here uh, this evening, to be able to talk uh, to, with such, uh, such distinguished uh, guests. I guess before we answer the question of how we should reform online law, we need properly to understand them. As Baroness Kennedy put in a recent House of Lords debate on the criminal justice system, changing law in response to public clamour, newspaper campaigns or police demands is a folly unworthy of good government. Now, I don't always agree with what she has to say about the law and the legal system, but these are words I think we ignore at our peril in the current debate. I don't think the police service has ever expressed a view on, on this subject, so I'm going to pass, uh, pass them by. There has been some public clamour. Roughly the same number of people have signed up to call for uh, the law of libel to be reviewed as though those who have petitioned at number 10 for Jeremy Clarkson to be Prime Minister. But there has been a very thoughtful campaign, uh, and I pay tribute to them, um, conducted by Index, uh, Penn, and the Sense, uh, on, uh, Sense About Science. It has been genuinely thoughtful, I think, and has engaged properly with, uh, with what I think is a matter of huge public importance. I wish I could say the same about the press, who it seemed to me have, have indulged in a considerable amount of self-interest and whinging. The result, frankly, has been a singularly unbalanced <coughs> public debate, and I do not <coughs> include Sense About Science, Index, and Pen uh, on, uh, on that. We've got a singularly unbalanced public debate based on a partial and biased understanding of the law. The consequence is that I am nervous about that important societal functions performed by libel law have been underplayed, and ill-thought-out reforms will serve to unbalance the public sphere to the detriment of all in that modern democratic state. Who in this debate speaks for those, life, those whose lives have been, have been and will continue to be <coughs> damaged by a powerful and occasionally arrogant press, or by an occasionally inaccurate and vitriolic blogosphere and, and internet. So if we turn first to look at the current state of English libel, what is the current state uh, of English libel? Well, it is true that it is not as favorable to freedom of speech as American law. But it is wholly different and much more media friendly than it was 15 years ago. The most obvious changes have come in relation to the curtailment of damages and the development of the, of the Reynolds public interest privilege. Whereas some claimants, it is true, may once have seen libel claims as a road to untaxed riches, this is no longer the case. Judges are now required to give considerable guidance to the jury about the correct approach to be taken in assessing damages. And the Court of Appeal can also substitute its own award for that of a jury or judge in the event that it regards the award as excessive. The effect, effective maximum is about 225,000. Awards of even half that 
are extraordinarily rare. The development of Reynolds privilege and the related reportage defense have widened substantially the room for error afforded to the media when reporting on matters of public interest. Provided the journalist is acted responsibly and the matter is of public interest, the defense is, ava is, is available. I think there's been a number of suggestions this evening that the law in, 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 uh, in the UK is in this respect very different from the law everywhere else in the world. That is simply not true. It is very different to the law in the United States. The law in the United States is essentially shaped by the First Amendment, the freedom of speech fundamentalists. If you look at most other common law jurisdictions, you will see, in fact, that they take a very, very similar approach to the approach and will be further revitalized, I think, by the Supreme Court and Joseph and, Sp and Spiller. It's much more accommodating to free speech than it once was. Certain legal entities, political parties, you'll be sad to know, and central and local government have been found to lack the capacity to sue. Others, such as those providing web search services like Google, effectively libel-proof. Legislation has been passed giving substantial protections to internet service providers. The enactment of the offer of a men's procedure enables a, a media defendant that has got something wrong to apologize and to so doing to get a substantial reduction on the damages that it would otherwise have to pay. These and other, and I could go on, these and other changes warrant the conclusion that the last 20 years have seen a radical shift in the balance of power in defamation claims. The importance of freedom of speech is now more fully and quite properly reflected in the law than was formerly the case. One consequence is, is that it is now very much more difficult than it has ever been to bring a successful libel claim. Turning to the reforms that have been proposed, no doubt we will all have in mind the 10 recommendations of the Pen Index and Censorship Report and the proposals made in Lord Leicester's bill. I would be the first to say that there is something in a very great number of the proposals made, and I congratulate both on the amount of work that they've done to get us to the stage we are, we are at. Time, however, you'll be pleased to know, um, prevents me from dealing uh, with these proposals in any great detail. But what I am concerned about is that both are based on a partial representation of the existing law. Let me give two uh, examples. If you read the explanatory notes to Lord Leicester's bill, you will be presented with an almost entirely negative view of the English law of life. Changes made over the last 15 years, not very much credit given for. And certainly statements are offered that to anybody not familiar with the subject would make it appear that the law is dysfunctional. Let me give you an example. So it said in, in paragraph five, the chilling effect upon the right to free expression induced by the threat of civil actions for libel has been repeatedly recognized by senior courts. The impression, of course, that is intended to be given here is that this is a bad thing. Mm. Yet there is a different and, in my view, rather more nuanced way of thinking about this proposition. Of course libel law chills. Libel law chills because that is one of its purposes. As a Canadian judge has put it, and in, uh, unforgettably, uh, an individual's reputation is not to be treated as regrettable but unavoidable roadkill on the highway of public controversy. By chilling, Unwarranted injury to reputation by means of incautious speech is prevented. The chilling effect of libel is only undesirable, and I accept that it can be undesirable, it is only undesirable to the extent that it causes true and important information to be withheld from the public sphere. The important question to ask, therefore, is whether we've got the balance between the protection of reputation and freedom of expression right. Merely asserting that libel law chills doesn't take us from. The second point I would dare make is that both sets of proposals are based on a mistaken worldview of the correct weight to be accorded to freedom of expression and the right to reputation. Lord Leicester, speaking of the recent, excuse me, the recent Westminster Legal Policy Forum, said on this business about the presumption in favour of free speech. Obviously, some argue that reputation and free speech must be equally balanced in all cases. I don't have that view. 
As a matter of common law or constitutional law, that's no longer the case, I think. And as a matter of even convention law, that isn't. I'm afraid I think that is a misperception, misconception of the law. The courts in this country and the Strasbourg Court have made clear that reputation is protected under Article 8. And when both rights are engaged, neither has automatic priority. And this was emphasized only last week by a very strong Court of Appeal with Marston Rolls presiding. Unfortunately, if you start, as both Lord Leicester and the Penn Index on Censorship Report do, by according priority to Article 10, it's almost inevitable that the law produced will be inconsistent with Strasbourg and the important societal interests currently protected by the law of libel will be in danger of being undermined. Now, how do we move forward? Well, I think we need to recognize that the faults in the existing law do not generally lie in respect of the balance it strikes between the protection of reputation and freedom of expression. I think, in general, English law gets that balance right. And so far, although I'm perfectly willing to be persuaded, so far I have not been shown sufficient evidence to suggest that English libel law is fundamentally broken. That is not to say that I do not think there ought to be a number of changes. And I think Lord Leicester's bill and Pen and Index on Censorship report, it very helpfully draws many of those uh, to, uh, to our attention. And these need to be dealt with and considered very carefully. Where I do think there is a problem is in relation to cost. The cost for both claimants and defendants in fighting a libel claim is far too high. We need to urgently address how court procedures can be made more efficient. For example, as Jan Cash said, by giving serious, by ensuring earlier determination of meaning, we need to give serious consideration to compelling the use of alternative dispute resolution. We also need to deal with some of the problems to which the CFAs can give that rise. They're hopefully informed by a rather more careful analysis of properly collected evidence than was the case with the last government um, when it attempted to carry favor, frankly, with the fourth estate by delivering a kicking to venal claimants lawyers. And you can see the tone again in the adjournment debate last week um, of the, the sort of views that are expressed by a number of MPs on this particular issue. In short, I think we need to take seriously the rights of all those who might be affected by any changes in the law. If we're going to have libel for reform, then so be it. But let that reform be coherent and not piecemeal and under principle. Most importantly, let it be based on a proper understanding and presentation of the existing law. Thank you. Last, I'm also going to ask Joshua Rosenberg to take the chair, and I'm afraid I have to apologise for my absence as the vote has just been called. Be back oh, in very shortly. Thank you very much. In the House, of course, there's a habit of saying too long when someone speaks for too long. If I speak for more than eight minutes, I hope Joshua will say too long. Um, <laughs> Uh, I, I keep a, a saying in my chambers to remind me of why I'm a liberal. Um, the saying is, the spirit of liberty is the spirit that is not too sure that it is right. And uh, I, so therefore I want to begin by saying that although the bill that I have uh, introduced represents eight months' work by Sabra Neal, myself, and Heather Rogers, QC, and also consultation with a wider group. Of course, I recognize that it can be improved in various ways, and I'm delighted by those who I regard as helpful in putting forward practical suggestions. I was taught by Roy Jenkins, my mentor, to argue to solutions and not to conclusions. So that's my starting point. When I thought about drafting a bill, I was determined that it would strike a fair balance between the important right to reputation and the important right to free speech. Uh, and that's what I have sought to do. 
Uh, I therefore resisted temptation to go much further and either to adopt the American rule uh, or, or to uh, otherwise transfer the burden of proof onto the, um, uh, onto, onto the claimant. Uh, and I think that anyone who actually bothers to read the bill carefully will recognize that the whole of the bill is about how to balance the public interest between free speech and reputation. I see at the back of the room my colleague Evan Harris, and I should just like to say that but for him, none of this would ever have happened because <coughs> it was Evan more than anybody who stimulated me uh, with the idea that I should produce a private member's bill. One of the really difficult things about producing a private member's bill in an area like this is that it's not like civil partnership or equality or forced marriage, where you start with a clean slate. You're starting with several hundred years of common law. And one of the really hard things is to decide what the balance should be between what Parliament does and what courts do. I was struck by the fact that Parliament has done very little and that the courts have been largely responsible for the development of the law as it is in this country and the rest of the common law world. And it seemed to me important not to be over prescriptive in the bill, not to set out too many detailed rules, but to set out some principles within which the courts could uh, interpret and apply the law. And that's a very difficult thing to do. Uh, when one or two of the speakers have talked about, for example, uh, there being two different kinds of defense, uh, Nigel Tate mentioned this, uh, Reynolds' defense of common law and a defense under a, a statute, obviously, if the statute is seeking to clarify what has been a common law defense, uh, one would expect the courts thereafter to treat the statute as giving guidance, rather as we do in different contexts, treat the Human Rights Act as giving guidance, but within that, to no longer to apply common law to the extent that it's inconsistent. I've not dealt with costs for the good reason that there are full existing powers to deal with costs. I've not dealt with personal privacy because that is an entirely complicated and separate subject and I tried to, to deal only with what I thought one could deal with in one bill. It's not a bill for the media. It's a bill intended for the citizen, for NGOs, for critics of abuses of power of one kind or another. And one of the things that's impressed me is that not only the free speech NGOs have helped, but NGOs dealing with consumer issues, with uh, fights against jihadist extremists, uh, with those dealing with questions about science, as famously understood now, those regard themselves, whatever the professors may say, uh, and whatever those who are practitioners may say, those on the receiving end find that the chilling effect causes them to lapse into self-censorship in ways that they find uh, dangerous. I can't really deal properly today with Professor Mullis. I wish I could, because his starting point, which I find really strange in a scholar, because I think this is written as by a scholar, <coughs> what I find really interesting is, in here, as he said today, he said, the real agenda behind the bill appears to be to alleviate as far as possible the chilling effect of libel on journalists, media organizations, and others. But in one sense, that's true. The unnecessary chilling effect is, of course, what the bill is partly about. And then he says, yet the chilling effect is precisely the purpose of libel law. Now, that surprises me. I thought that the purpose of libel law was not to chill speech that ought to be published. I thought the purpose was to indicate one's good reputation. And then it goes on. It prevents unwarranted injury to reputation by means of incautious speech and is undesirable only to the extent that true, that true and important information is withheld from the public sphere. Now, if that really were the law, that only true and important information uh, uh, would be uh, what one could have by way of defense, we would be very close to the law of Singapore and Malaysia, 
laws which we took trouble when we did the harmonization of tort law to make sure couldn't simply be imported into our system. So apart from the allegations of lip service to this, that, and the other, uh, and other attacks upon the and suggestions that the bill will lead to the death of libel uh, and undermining of the important societal interest of the debt. I have to say to the professor that I don't find that approach helpful. I think it is not really a fair representation of the work that has been put into this, and I'd like to debate it on some other occasion. Now, um, I'm not going to go through what the bill does in any detail, uh, but can I just say that it is designed partly to encourage alternative dispute resolution and speedy settlements. It doesn't deal with ADR because Charles Gray's working party is doing that at the moment. It is designed to promote self-regulation, and I entirely agree with what Joe has said about the need for reform of the PCC to make sure that it's independent and gives effect to revenues, because I'd much rather that these matters are dealt with by self-regulation than by litigation. The reason for changing the presumption about jury trials is, as Joe has said, to facilitate speedy settlements and reduce costs. The reason why we have dealt with the defense of truth, which we now call it, uh, in the way that we have is to allow judges to rule on meanings, not just the most serious meaning put forward by claimants, in order to enable speedy settlements at the outset. That is one of the purposes of the bill, and I think that's a very important one. The reason we have not put in a special defense for scientists and academics, but have instead cut down the Reynolds criteria into what Sir Brian Neal and Heather Rogers and I thought were the essentials. The reason we've done it that way is because the Reynolds defense, the public interest defense, is not there to protect any one class of persons over others. It's not there to defend any to protect any the media. It's not there to protect mainly scientists. Uh, it could just as well be there to protect someone like Will Hughes, the audience who spoke the other day about the problems with historians, for example. It's there to protect which the Consumer Association, when it disparages product and is threatened with libel. It's there to protect William, the anti-terrorist organization, when it makes strong criticisms about uh, a particular uh, broadcaster who is, they think, encouraging jihadist extremism. In other words, one has to fashion these defenses so that they are available to everyone. Now, I have been very careful, as I say, not to hamper the claims. They will be hampered if, if conditional fee agreements were reduced to nothing at all, because we had no delay. But of course, it is bear, worth bearing in mind that it is largely the rich who now use life proceedings, and the evidence of those who represent them uh, does not indicate that there's a large market for the poor to vindicate their reputations. Uh, and so what we have at the moment is largely wealthy claimants with largely wealthy lawyers bringing cases not only against powerful newspapers and broadcasters, but against the weak. Uh, and uh, that seems to me to be an inequality of arms which ought to be faced and recognized. It's not I who say that, it is those on the receiving end who say that. I am simply, I have no ax to grind, I have no vested interest. I don't represent claimants or defendants, unfortunately, much these days. I'm trying to do this as a midwife, not as a, an advocate for one side or the other. Now, one of the problems that no one has yet mentioned properly uh, is the problem about internet life. And that's a good area to think about because it gives rise to really difficult practical problems. And I'm far from sure that our, my bill gets this right. I think it may be too weak at the moment. Let me try to explain. If you are Amazon Books in America selling a defamatory book, or if you are Google, whose search engine reveals a, a, some defamatory publication or statement, or if you are Mumsnet, <coughs> uh, also with a website, the difficult problem is what should the law do in requiring that host of the web to take down 
an allegedly defamatory publication. What my bill rather weakly does at the moment is to distinguish between the innocent facilitator and the rest and to say that where the um, claimant alleges that there's a defamatory publication, then it must be taken down within 14 days by the website post or else they've got to defend the life of themselves. I'm not sure that that is the right solution. I'm not, if any of you here are dealing with uh, the internet, I'd love to know what you think about that. The American position is different to some of you know, and there's a big debate in Europe about what the right solution should be. The most extreme solution in favor of the internet service provider would be to say they only have to take it down if there's a judgment or a concluded settlement. <coughs> so one of the, as I say, one of the, one of the weak in my bill is it may not properly address internet um, defamation in a way that Google, Yahoo, and the rest needed to. Uh, finally, I think it's just about, just about now. Okay, finally, uh, finally may I say that um, I put in, I haven't put in, uh, there won't be a lawyer's feeding frenzy. Someone said a lawyer's feeding frenzy. That, I think, is really not likely. But what the bill is really doing is what Sir Anthony Mason said a long time ago in an Australian case, the Fairfax case, where he was talking about confidentiality. And he said that the tort of confidentiality needed to be looked at through different spectacles in terms of the public interest when it was not a purely private dispute. Uh, and that was something which arose in Spycatcher, which Desmond Brown and I were involved in in various ways. That notion of the public interest, of looking at a private law taught through public spectacles, is really what it's about. If you want a long-winded way of describing it, it's the constitutionalization of a private law taught. And the only reason why we do it for libel or privacy or copyright is because information wrongs give rise to tensions between free speech and other competing rights and interests. And I simply don't agree with, um, uh, <coughs> with the professor, I'm sorry to say, I don't agree at all that the starting point should be other than a common law like free speech, subject always to the compelling interest in protecting reputation and other interests. In every other country but the United Kingdom has a constitutional bill of rights, for whom the starting point would be free speech. The only country that in the Western democracies that I know doesn't have that is the Republic of Ireland, and De Valera's constitution gave much greater weight to reputation with consequences that led to rather difficult results in the Republic. But otherwise, I have to say, every other country in the common law world that has a constitution makes the starting point speech, but then gives proper weight, as you should do, to the right to reputation. And I, as you would expect of someone in the great coalition that we serve in, I totally agree with the Attorney General when he said one should not think of you know, junking or eradicating or making impossible or you know, all of those kinds of words, the right to reputation. That's not the matter about it. To Anthony, and I'm sorry that I heard only his first words and his last. My thanks to Joshua for stepping in. It's now time to have a discussion or debate. Can I ask people to ask questions if they want, or to make contributions? Perhaps they would like to identify themselves when they speak, and could they keep their contributions like not too long so that other people can have an opportunity of participating as well? So. Uh, Alexander Horn from the Commons Research Service. Uh, when the Select Committee uh, looked at this last year, um, they considered not only the issue of defamation, but also that of privacy. And it's interesting to know whether the panel thinks that those two issues should be separated out. Who would like to go first? Yeah, well, obviously privacy gives rise to a whole range of things. Data protection being one of them. Commercial privacy, personal privacy. If it's to be legislated upon, 
it raises, as, and of course it has been for data protection in particular, it raises a great many different issues. And I am not so immodest as to think that in a private member's group I could probably deal with both. So my answer is I'm not sure about legislation and personal privacy, but I am sure that I would be written off even more than I could pursue had I done that. Is anybody else? Thanks, sir. Sure. Um, I think that there is, it's a very important point the committee looked at, and it's a really interesting point here tonight because there's been very worrying, uh, from my perspective, developments in the European jurisprudence, which now acknowledges reputation rights as part of Article 8. Someone else mentioned it tonight. Um, the right to a private life, in my view, should be completely distinct to uh, one's reputation. And the fact that European law is now tying us into this combination means that the Select Committee was absolutely correct to look at it. How we deal with it, um, with the bill in its draft form, I, I, I just don't know, I haven't gone that far, but I certainly worry very much about the extension of Article 8 and the protection that it's now given. Now, could I just say, I mean, oddly enough, I was criticised before, this is my understanding, oddly enough, I think that argument I understand is that it's semantic because I have no doubt that the right to reputation is a fundamental right. No doubt about it at all. And whether you find it in Article 8 or, or, or as an exception in Article 10 is to me beside the point because that the principle of proportionality applies wherever you find it. So I find the Strasbourg Court in, in a muddle of that. So sometimes they treat it as though it is in Article 8 and more recently not. But my, my, I, am truth, I am assuming the right to reputation is a fundamental right. That's one of the premises for that. But I agree with you, so some of the case law privacy goes too far, like the government handle the case and the product goes too far. And what that's mostly seeking to do in Strasbourg at the moment has only been done in East European countries. And that, I think, is to, to require a rule that whenever anyone wants to invade someone else's privacy, They've got to give notice so that there can be an injunction. I find that going too far. Does anybody else on the panel want to come in on that? Otherwise, we'll move to the next question. Yes. Uh, Tracy Brown, Sense About Science, as far as I I was really interested, from uh, Professor Mullis, uh, to, to hear that the law gives us so much um, in the way of public interest defence, because I look at the cases uh, that have confronted us, in which Joe Glanville outlined, for example, a cardiologist criticising uh, the representation of um, a heart device uh, trial, uh, and Simon Singh criticising uh, uh, unfounded treatments being offered to cure infant conditions. And I can't think of cases that more represent the public interest. So I have to ask myself, why then was this wonderful defence not available uh, to those cases, which I think all of us in this room would agree, um, are, are absolutely the epitome of what we would call the public interest defence. And I think part of the problem is the reference point is the handful of cases that we reach the courts and we don't hear um, about the citizen critics and the human rights groups and the uh, scientific debate. And I have to say that from a scientific point of view, working out what's true and important is actually the role of public debate uh, rather than the role of the courts. Um, so I think it's very important that that what comes first in Anthony Lester's bill, and I hope will come first in, in what the government puts forward, is the case for a public interest defence. But I think perhaps we should look again at the provisions, because in the spirit of upholding the freedom of the citizen critic, because in particular, I mean, Anthony's mentioned the inequality of arms, um, and the problem of large organisations silencing their critics. Well, you know, I welcome the provision in, in, in Anthony's bill um, regarding companies having a higher burden of proof. Uh, although many of us in the campaign do feel um, that the uh, malicious falsehood uh, is the remedy for companies um, and that we should keep defamation for the protection of individuals uh, who have been wronged. Um, but what about, I mean, why stop at companies? I, I, do, I think perhaps for any organisation that performs a function that is public in nature, why should they be able to silence discussion by individuals, by citizen critics? Uh, I'm thinking of, of, the lawyers in the room will be familiar with Derbyshire, uh, which the House of Lords said it was of the highest public importance that there's uninhibited public criticism in the interest of democracy and accountability. So 
Why, Anthony, could, could he not include something like that in the bill, or for the government too? There's, there's quite a lot there. I wonder if the professor <laughs> who would like to start as he was mentioned first. I, I guess there, sorry, I guess there are a number of things I would, would, would say to this. I mean, it doesn't seem to me that you need a provision saying that um, public bodies can't, like central government and local government can't sue, when that is in fact the law already. Um, the central government can't sue, political parties can't have no right to sue local governments. Uh, local government have, have no right to sue. Um, it's always puzzled me why Simon Singh never didn't plead Reynolds, I have to say. <coughs> I mean, it seems to me to be preeminently uh, a matter of uh, a matter of public uh, public interest. That that particular um, that particular uh, in that particular case. So I'm 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 very puzzled, frankly, uh, by it. Um, it uh, it also seems to me that as long as those people, the critics, choose their words reasonably carefully and do not engage in ad hominem attacks. They will very easily bring themselves under the Reynolds event. So I'm, I'm not sure I accept that Reynolds is quite as toothless uh, as uh, as it seems. And I'd, I'd be very interested to know again why some seem to. Is the list here? I can ask him at the back. First, first of all, on Reynolds. What went wrong? In, I argued Reynolds. What went wrong in Reynolds was that Lord Steyn wanted to look at German constitutional law. And we finished up with ad hoc balancing. And um, the president of the German Constitutional Court told me afterwards it was a complete cop out because the, there's no weighting given to any of the factors. And therefore, it is truly standardless. And what we've attempted to do in clause one is to refine the criteria leading it to the judges. Now, Trace's point about the Derbyshire case is a really important new idea, which I which I agree with. And I don't know whether Dominic. Um, what Dominic will think about this, but I mean, in Derbyshire, the law lords said a central government or local government body has to use malicious falsehood and can't use libel law because of democracy. And one of the cases they referred to was a South African case called Die Spurbond, where a railway company in before the first, Second War was, was struck out from using libel law. Now, I think what Tracy is asking essentially is why don't we include in the government bill a provision that where someone is exercising functions of a public nature, as it were section six of the Human Rights Act, we should take the logic of, of uh, Derbyshire and extend it. And I know of only two cases where it's been extended. One was extended to British coal and the other extended to a political party. And so I think I, I'm guilty of not having thought about, when, about Derbyshire in what we did. I think we need something for companies and something for public bodies as well. The problem I have about companies, and we wrestled with this, is the distinction between what is a company and what is not a company is difficult because there are many bodies that are similar to companies. And once you, and so we put it in, and we were quite cautious in saying, all the company has to, we didn't say go by way of malicious falsehood. But I personally think there's something attractive about that. But then you've got the problem about the little company, the one woman or one man company, and the huge company, and how you, so I find that the company side is really difficult, and I'm sure that that will have to be considered. Thank you. I just saw, Robert, that uh, Simon Singh's list is here, and I wondered if you'd be able to answer Alice's question as to why uh, you didn't defend the case on the grounds of Reynolds. Well, yeah, I think that the, the, the first time that was ever mentioned was by Lord Justice Sedley in the course of appeal, who, when he said he thought it could be a Reynolds case, was sneered at by the Master of the Rolls and the Lord Chief Justice. So, uh, uh, yeah, the, the, the point, the, <laughs> The same result was given by far less eminent lawyers and some more eminent lawyers. And I think a, a comment piece in a newspaper article is manifestly not going to be Reynolds as it stands. It's, uh, it is a piece that takes one side. I mean, a Reynolds case, I, I worked for Nigel for three years, and I think we only once found a case, that came, an article that came across our desk, and we thought that's Reynolds. 
it was it was a very balanced article where someone had put both sides of a story and it related to a candidate for a local election who was which was taking place in a couple of well in the next during the time that newspaper was a print. That was the only time we thought that's Reynolds. Um, that was a Reynolds article. Singh didn't write a Reynolds article, but then no one who writes an opinion or comment piece is like the other two. It's, it's a different defense, and I think that I've never met anyone in practice aside from, well, I've never met him, but, but I was in the same room as Lord Justice Sedley, who's ever suggested it wasn't. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> could, could I just correct one thing, which is, the bill deals with opinions as well as facts in, in clause one. Sir. Uh, uh, Matthew Sinclair from the Taxpayers Alliance. I mean, we've, we've had reports where we've had, and this is what really makes me angry about this issue, is we've had reports where we've had the threats to free speech from jihadist extremists, that's mentioned, conspiring with the threats of libel law, the two combining to form a much greater chilling where someone's got to both overcome their fear that there are violent people they will upset out there, and they will have overcome their fear that Castle Rock are going to come for them. And frankly, I'm having a toss us whether Abu Hamza or Castle Rock are a bigger threat to British freedom. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, fine, so, uh, the And now, what, re what really strikes me though is we've now got this circle where we have, we can't introduce greater defences because that will increase costs. We have costs magnified because of success fees. So we're asking uh, people who lose cases to pay for all the cases that complainants have lost. So we have this magnifying this cost problem. But every time we attack that, you know, we get bleeding stumps brought out by, by these few exceptional cases where success fees are to be important for genuinely hard cases who might not be able to get access to justice. And all it leads me to is that if in the end we're being told that serious reform isn't possible, then perhaps the only solution for people like me, who aren't in this game for moderate reform, as far as I'm concerned, if the only serious reform is a radical one, is we need to go to the kind of defensive American tower. I've been to America, and frankly, I didn't see a press that was wildly more vituperative than one here. I didn't see a press that was wildly less responsible. I've been there, and frankly, I've engaged with the American political debate, and I really don't see what the huge problem is with the, with the United States and with their political list. They have more investigative reporting than we do by a mile. So, uh, just to me, you're telling us we need to use the nuclear option. But there are different chilling factors in play in the United States. The principal one is damages. As I, last time I checked, the average award by a jury in the United States in a defamation action was $2.2 million. And that makes people behave themselves and they check their facts. My American clients can't believe that the English papers don't check their facts because the American papers do check their facts with the person they're writing out about because they don't want to get sued and have malice proved against them and end up forking out $2 million for damages. Um, they have their chilling effect and you, I'm sure you wouldn't uh, like to pay out $2 million for damages and we have ours. So we can have a Pass over to Joe. Thanks, Evel. It's nice to hear you say what you say. I agree with you, and I, one of the things I've been quite depressed about in this campaign is the extent to which actually the Americans have me, been made to, out to be somewhat evil for the First Amendment, and it's one of the things that I've always admired them for, um, which you might expect since I work for a free speech organisation. <laughs> but, um, but, but I, you know, I. There was, um, we looked as if we were going to get somewhere with costs, and, and the government has said they're going to look at it, but they have said, um, uh, I think uh, the Justice Junior Minister said last week they were going to look at it in the round, which suggests that they're going to be looking at Lord Justice Jackson's report and, and not defamation costs in isolation. But there was an attempt, you might remember, just before the election that was foiled at the last moment where success fees were going to be re sort of reduced to 10%. And there is enormous hostility to that change, which I, I have to say I'm really baffled by. Because the evidence seems to point, and Lord Justice Jackson says this himself in his report, it seems to suggest that um, really very few CFA cases are lost. It suggests that claimant lawyers generally seem to take on the cases they're fairly sure they're going to win. I think even Nigel Tate has said that they win most of their cases. I think probably around 95% of your cases you win. Over 90%. So I don't understand why you need success fees. Um, the, the, the problem is that in the cases you lose, um, it takes about 50 
wins to pay for one loss, um, 50 early wins to pay for one loss, and the costs of losing are far greater than the cost of the success for you get in the case you win. Uh, we've looked at it and we're not, this means anything, we're not revenue neutral. We, um, like ask my friend five years, we lose more money on the, the losing cases than we make on the, the winning cases. But where we do uh, make up is that we get more cases because more people can go to, to court and otherwise, so, um, if they couldn't afford it, they wouldn't use it. Uh, I mean, uh, um, why did I not use uh, the Sullivan Rule in, in the bill, even though I argued for the Sullivan Rule in Reynolds? The problem with the Sullivan Rule is that if it were confined, if you go back to Tracy Brown's point, if it were confined to public officers, public authorities, political speech, uh, it would make some kind of sense. But what's happened in the States is that after Sullivan, it was extended to public figures, and public figures included a baseball coach, as in the Betts case. So you then finish up with an absurdity in the United States, which is it both goes too far in covering that sort of public figure and doesn't go far enough in tackling other aspects of the public interest, because there's more than political speech, like scientific speech, that needs to be, or artistic speech, or historical speech, that needs to be protected. So there is something unsatisfying, even though I was brought up myself at Harvard Law School to love the First Amendment, uh, there are things wrong with it. And therefore, I quite deliberately adopted uh, an, an English common law approach and a European approach. But uh, there are areas, like the one that Tracy mentioned, where you've got, um, a Derbyshire County Council, where effectively it's the American rule. That's to say, if it's a public authority, it has to use um, misfeas uh, it has to use malicious prosecution. In other words, it has to prove malice, recklessness, and damage, which is exactly similar to the American thing. So uh, I think one has to be very careful about using the American stuff. And I'm not anti-American. I think Joanne wants to come in. Well, the, the simple fact is that European law will not allow us to have a Sullivan defence even if we wanted one. I mean, we can't, we can't adopt the First Amendment in any form because uh, we are banned by European law on this. And we have actually introduced the Human Rights Act, which brings that into British law um, as a statute as well. So we, we have to automatically balance Article 8 um, and um, Article 10 um, all sorts of jurisprudence has developed and it comes back to the other point I made earlier about now there being reputation rights under Article 8 which was designed to protect private and family life. So even if everyone in this room wanted it and all of the politicians were prepared to grant it, we couldn't have it the way, the way the law currently stands. the way our treaty obligations currently stand, it might be said. <laughs> the point was raised about privacy in the Select Committee. I mean, the Select Committee said they were satisfied with the jurisprudence and ED's judgment in uh, Mosley. Many of us who were on the free speech side thought it was good as far as it went, not necessarily, as Anthony said, supporting Mosley in his, in his latest case. And, and, and that actually goes to show that the campaign for libel reform is not simply, it's not at all, a creature of the press who are far more concerned actually and antagonised by uh, the privacy judgments that they've been on the receiving end of. So I don't think that is an issue here. I just wanted to reinforce what's been said by Joanne and Nigel about firstly companies. I think the simplest way would be, if you're defining companies anyway with the need to prove damages, you may as well just say companies rely on malicious falsehood and have to show malice or recklessness. If there's a definitional problem with companies, it doesn't matter what you do, there's still a definitional problem, but it doesn't solve, it doesn't create a problem in tax law as far as I know, uh, certainly not a definitional one in tax law. Um, and on the question, I just really finally want to raise this point about the importance of having a public interest defence. I absolutely agree that that should, which quite rightly, clause one of the draft bill, and I hope it would be in a government bill. But just because it's designed to capture more than simply the press, the citizen critic and so forth, doesn't mean that, as Nigel suggests, and supported by Joanne, you couldn't have, because there is already a list of statutory qualified privileged beneficiaries, allocate 
where there's valid reason to do so, as Nigel said, which is academic peer review and an automatic right to reply as exists in these journals, why you couldn't put that in, because it would remove the chill. It wouldn't affect Seeing or Wilmser's. These weren't peer reviewed, but it would prevent editors of journals having to go to lawyers to argue with often companies, and usually pharmaceutical companies, with deep pockets. Uh, and they'd just be able to point to QP, which is just a, a quicker way than having to go all the way to the defence. So I think this is a fascinating discussion that's been had, and I'm delighted that there are so many people with open minds as we consider these reforms. I'd like to try and get two or yeah. three more people in before we stop. You have to be avoid being too prescriptive in the bill and leaving proper things to courts. Now, when you're dealing with statutory qualified privilege, you can list all the bodies like the courts of Zimbabwe, the parliaments of South Africa, public meetings, press conferences, where a fair and accurate report with a right of reply, qualified privilege, no problem. But what we thought about, we thought about your point really carefully, Evan. We decided that once you start to have categories with rules, saying special thing for peer review and academic thing, then you find you're doing it for lots of other categories, like the one historians I mentioned and others do. So we thought the best thing was to say the nature of the publication and its context. It was Tracy, I remember, who insisted on context, so you could then make it scientific, for example, historical, for example. But we have to have a partnership with courts, and that's why I don't want this to be a cage or a code or a rigid set of rules. It has to be a set of principles. And having Brian Neal to guide me constantly, you know, why don't we leave that to the judges? That's what we're trying to do. Which is, so I, I won't satisfy you because you have a particular interest in the, in the scientific side. I understand it. But I think it is covered. But then so are the other interests covered. That's my answer. Lord, do you have to point exactly what you're raising? Tom Hacker, Oxford University. Thanks very much. Um, I found it very interesting and I think it's worth noting the First Amendment wasn't interpreted anything like the way it is now until quite late in the 20th century, um, with exceptions to certain political campaigning, which is an odd exception to make for free speech. But the, um, I was wondering, I think there's a danger of some of the proposals being floated, there's also great awareness, including by Lord Leicester, of creating special privilege. So um, what do people think of the danger of setting aside special categories? Whether it's negatively, if you say corporations can't sue, you effectively mean stuff can be published which effectively libels the directors of that company. Because um, you know, if, if, if you attack a company by definition, and on the other hand, um, and so you create special exemptions where people can sue. And on the other hand, I was quite curious about this press complaints commission idea, just because of the enormous power it gives without legal process to a body to force things. I wouldn't necessarily be against having integrated into libel law, but I wonder about the dangers of making a more powerful press complaints commission. So, shall I? Yeah. 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 Well, the press complaints commission has quite a lot of power already. Mm -hmm. um, whether it uses it correctly was really what I was talking about, and whether the correct people are in place to uh, dispose of its dispose its power. So that's the first point. I do think that there is an issue, and again, it's been mentioned by almost everyone here tonight about British press standards. Um, and I, I know there has been a group set up saying lawyers for media standards, and that some journalists I have met during this campaign have really stood out to me as exceptions. Um, but, you know, in the diligence that they deploy when they're investigating and doing their work. Those are the journalists we really want to try to promote and have do more of their serious work. But, you know, we've all had, or well, quite a lot of people in this room have had experience of facts not being checked and life stories being rewritten um, because the most basic things are overlooked. And it is quite shocking, and I, you know, I, I put my libel barrister hat on here, so it is quite shocking when cases come across your desk and the most cursory of phone calls could have prevented the whole thing. So there are issues there which I think are important and I, I wouldn't hesitate to actually give the Press Complaints Commission more power. I don't think it needs it, I think it needs to be used properly and the, uh, use the power that it has already. Um, does that answer your question? <laughs> Yeah, I'll answer it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, Adam Chu, I'm a partner at Carter. I've just got two brief points. First of all, 
I have to say I am very significantly disagree with Robert about what he said about um, Reynolds uh, a few years ago. My own experience is that Reynolds has had a very chilling effect on claiming libel. Um, I've you know, for every number of complaints that come through the door, a significant number of them. You say at the time that uh, Reynolds is there, Jamil is there now as well. Um, that there is a reasonable chance that the newspaper will be able to make this stick on responsible journalism. So I don't accept for one moment that Reynolds is, is, is hopeless. Quite the opposite, and all the most of the trends since then, I think, have um, continued in that direction, from your being one of the case point. The second one, I have to say, she, very seriously, she would call Lester's premise, which is that mine was the preserver of the rich and famous. Um, I don't accept that at all. Can you then tell us examples where Libel law has been used in your personal experience with the court. Yes, <laughs> I, I acted about six months ago, no, 18 months ago, for example, for a, um, a Muslim bus driver who the son had been accused of being a violent jihadist. Um, complete rubbish. Um, absolute rubbish. Of course, in all sorts of comments about like having a beard and clip years and watched the Muslim bus driver train, all this sort of thing. Um, complete nonsense. Lily Reed is another. Lily Reed. We can literally give you a thousand examples. So I do have to take quite a serious issue with the suggestion that it's, um, that it's uh, simply the preserve of the rich and the, the foreign, which seems to be the, the premise that people in all of these things operate, and it's simply not true. Simon Sane is another. You know, I, I think that it's important to get that kind of material, and I think one of the beauties of what the government are proposing is that a draft bill is going to have pre-legislative scrutiny with a parliamentary committee and everyone in this room will be able to give evidence as well as opinion. And that I think is the right way to go about warming. No longer speaking, I think it's been asked. My role is that I'm chairman of the House of Lords Communications Committee. And at some stage in my four years stint as if I survive it, we will be looking into the future of uh, serious investigative journalism which is at the moment under very serious threat so that's one that's one of the reasons why i'm here the other thing that has struck me in all of this was the point that the gentleman from carter ruck made about costs if you are a small person who is sued by a big person it appears to me however keenly you win you still land up with an enormous cost bill why can't the courts actually give somebody the costs that they have actually incurred in defending themselves against a libel action by a big company. And I thought the cost point strikes me as being extremely important. Any response from panel members on that? I've got a question. You've got a question? Yes. Um, we make an exception. It'll be the last question. Desmond Brown. Uh, the, the question is for uh, Joe, who uh, lamented the decision in flood, this really being the last straw. Uh, the question is this, uh, where did the Court of Appeal go wrong in applying Reynolds? Uh, and uh, would Lord Leicester's bill have produced a different result? And if so, how? Having regard to the finding that the journalists had failed to verify the allegations made. I assume, assume you meet Joe the non-lawyer as opposed to Joe the lawyer, don't you? <laughs> and in a room full of lawyers, the only non-lawyer on the panel, I'm answering Desmond Brown QC's question, so I hope you all pay attention. <laughs> Could set a precedent. Um, my understanding is that um, the, the, the real problem with this is that the, in the Court of Appeal, that they expected the journalists to have proven the allegations. And they accused the journalists of the, of the allegations being unsubstantiated, which I think isn't the case. They, had, they, were una, they were unable to prove the allegations, the truth of the allegations. And that seemed to be what the judges in the Court of Appeal were requiring. And the implication of that seems to be that a journalist who publishes a story reports an allegation that they haven't proven is at the risk of um, not being able to get a Reynolds defence or if they get it, it might be overturned. 
And so that seems to me to, to put an, um, um, uh, an unrealistically high demand on um, the kind of evidence that a journalist gathers. Um, and it also seems to go back to Reynolds pre-Jamil, because Jamil seemed to be saying, you don't need to tick the boxes. Um, so, that, so it seems to be retrogressive. I'm not sure, um, I, would, I would hope um, that Lord Leicester's public interest defence or whatever version finally makes it onto the books um, will again not be um, committing to a checklist um, that obviously there are extremely important journalistic standards um, that have to, be, have to be adhered to and that any judge will have to consider in, in considering whether a piece is in the, in the public interest, is in responsible journalism. But it seems to me that the flood case uh, was a step too far. Where the Times does seem to have, have slipped up is in not amending the piece online because uh, subsequently the police officer was cleared and that is something that the Times um, should have done. That, so that is my understanding um, of, of the case. I think um, Ashley wants to possibly the last word. Yeah, uh, I mean, there's, you can't afford me, so I'm right. certainly not going to give detailed analysis of why I think that this is justice um, that uh, as the Court of Appeal erred and the trial judge was correct in the way he struck the balance. The only point I would make to you is that I don't think we should have to read uh, 80 or 90 paragraphs of flood and the different speeches in Jamil and construe Reynolds in order to tell the people here who uh, practical people what is the nature of the uh, responsible journalist defense. I think it's perfectly possible to set up good criteria that are user-friendly and that is the purpose of the responsible journalism provision. The other thing which has not been mentioned is I believe that as far as journalists are concerned, they're a profession and they've got to be held hmm. to professional standards if they want to take advantage of that defence. And the reason for the PCC involvement and codes is to encourage journalists to be a professional. And I don't find reading Flood, which I have done, or Jamil, or Reynolds, creates the kind of incentives for responsible <coughs> journalists which I think should be there. And, and, and I'm very glad, by the way, that the South African uh, Constitutional Court in the Namibia case have adopted something very similar to what's in the bill last week as a matter of their common law. So I, I think that what I'm trying to do, what Brown Dean is trying to do, is to use factors that judges can interpret and apply with greater consistency. That's what, that's what I'm about. You may be right in it were better than um, Mr. Justice Tugendhat. I take the opposite view, but it shouldn't be left to that kind of argument. And then for you and I to earn our living trying to construe all of this to NGOs and citizens. That's, that's really what I believe, and that's what I'm trying to do. Thank you. Now, I think on that basis, that being the last word. Thank you very much. time they have given uh, this evening and for this very lively and entertaining debate, to thank Policy Exchange, to thank Dean Godson for having organised it, and to thank you all very much for coming. <laughs>